In this video, I'll show you how to render a game ready eye inside of Marmoset. In Substance Painter, we'll set up and export all the textures that you need. By the end, you'll have the perfect eye that you can use on all your character projects. Hey, I'm Virtus, a character art director and university lecturer in the games industry. I'm giving all my games knowledge to you, so turn on notifications to never miss a video. So we complete the high poly, which we don't need anymore. We have our low poly either in Blender or Maya, and those are going into Marmoset. Now we need to make sure all the textures are set up correctly. So first, what you'll do is just double check that you have texture sets named correctly because this will impact your file naming. Hold Control, Shift and E. That will bring up the export texture settings. So for us, we are going to be exporting the cornea and the inner eye. The first selection is output directory. This is basically where all the files are going to go. Output template for this, we can use metal roughness. So those output templates, the settings are actually here. And without going too deep into it, we can select PBR metallic rough and it's showcasing what's going on. So the first one is a basic base color. The second is roughness, metallic, the normal map we're exporting, height information, which we probably won't use and emissive, which we definitely won't use. So in a normal games industry, we usually compress these, but for portfolio and marmoset, it's usually better just to leave them separate, just in case we need to adjust the textures themselves. As this is for final render, the file type we can use is PNG or Targa, which is lossless, so it's not gonna adjust it anymore. And we're going to export at maximum size. So 4K is gonna be more than enough in a games industry. <laughs> you would probably not even go over about, about 2K. Make sure your padding is set to infinite and then you can click export. If you really want to double check, you can come into the list of exports and it's going to show you the naming conventions that happen here, the type of the format and where it's going. So we've got two different sets of texture here, one for the cornea and one for the inner eye. And then we'll use these for Marmoset. Okay, so in Marmoset, the first thing we're going to do is bring in the meshes. So in the top left, you can come to file and import. You'll see I have some folders and textures already ready. It's because I've sent this out, all the files to people on the members list. So if you are a member, make sure you watch that video and download them so you can use the resources. If not, we can go through the process of setting it up now. So we'll first select the FBX, which contains all three of the elements. And on the left side, we can hide and show these all independently. So that's going to be useful. To start with, I'm going to hide the cornea just so we're working on the inner eye. So in the top right, we already have assigned the materials that we can work with. So if you click on M in I, which is lining up to the texture set in substance. First thing we'll do is add a base color, also known as an albedo. So you can click navigate to the textures. For this I'll be using the iris and then we can select them manually. To be honest, there's a way I prefer to do it. So I'm going to close this. So the final way to do it is basically open up the textures. I like to display these by their icons and make them quite large. You can hold control to zoom in and out. And now it's a case of just drag and dropping. So with the iris, we drag that to the albedo. Normal map comes up to surface under normals. Now ambient occlusion actually goes to the occlusion settings here. First, you have to assign it. Doesn't do a whole lot adjustment to the mesh, but it's just nice to have anyway. It's more sort of like physically accurate. So you drag that into there. And then the iris mask here is just something we exported to help with the subsurface scattering. Okay, so to start, you see we've got this sort of dry eye in here. Now, because our roughness microsurface value is going to be utilized from the cornea mesh, we actually don't need any roughness here. So turn that completely up and you'll see it gives this more dry look. Right now, I'm also gonna change the skylights because it's not looking so good. So inside of your sky settings, there's a library of HDRs. So experiment around with these. I certainly have a couple of my favorites. For this, I'll be using the interior sections, abandoned house attic. The reason I chose this is it's got a nice square window look, and those usually do quite well when it comes to reflectance. You'll see that on the cornea. So next, I'm gonna come up to this little light bulb and add an eye. If you're interested in marmoset lighting, there's another video where I basically light a complete Yoda so go check that out if you want to after this video. But for this, what we're doing is we just want quite a harsh light, turning up the brightness quite far. And this is so we can introduce some subsurface scattering. So if we look at the corner here, it's a very gray and hard border. And this is where subsurface scattering comes in useful. So under the transmission settings, we can change this to subsurface scattering. 
and you look at the eye, it gives this really nice soft effect. So with this scattering depth, we can adjust this up and down. You see, it's just making it a look a little bit more natural. So I'm going to keep it there for the time being because we can always come back to it when we change the lighting, start to adjust all things independently. If you look in the center of the eye, we have the iris. So the iris has its own texture. Quite simply for that, what we can do is make it black. So click on the color, turn it black. It's got a little shine and reflectance on it. We don't want that. So you can come to the micro surface and turn the roughness up to one. And now we've got this infinite dark looking pupil and iris. So this one usually tricks students out. I've seen them on a couple of portfolio submissions, to be honest. If you look at the eye, the normal maps aren't really interacting how we'd like them to. It's not so apparent when you first look, but what we have to do is come into the normals and flip the Y. It's also known as flipping the green channel. And you'll see it looks ever so slightly different. It just means that the light is coming from the correct direction. If you're interested in looking into it, it's DirectX and OpenGL formats. The biggest you can, impact you can see is actually on the right side where we're now getting more of a correct representation of the eye where it's coming inwards instead of outwards. Okay, so next we can come and insert the shading information in the outer cornea. So first come to the top left and we'll show the cornea. Obviously that's covering the entire eye now. So now we need to make it translucent. So in different games engines and different real-time renderers and also CG, they're all called different things, base color, albedo, roughness, glossiness, and all those sorts of things. So in Marmoset, we call it transmission. So under transmission, we can change to refraction. So this is really useful for things like water and glass or the outer side of an eye. Now <laughs> you can see it's very blurry here. So we have to change a couple of settings. So the first thing we can sort of play around with is the roughness bias. So this just turns down how cloudy the thing is looking. If you look at the highlight, it's really broad and wide. So to change that, we come down to roughness. We'll turn this down really, really far actually. And the further down we do it, you can see that the reflectance value has basically increased to the extent where we can actually see out the window. <laughs> so that's a, that's a nice effect. But the problem is it looks very fake in CG. So this is where our textures come in. So in Substance, if you remember, we made a tileable cornea height map to normal map to give it that nice little tool wobble. So we can drag that onto normal map and you'll see the effect it has. It just gives it a nice little wobble. So looking a little bit more realistic. Won't make much of a difference, but you can flip the Y if you want to. Now, the problem is if you get up really close, this starts to look slightly low quality. So in games, usually what we do is add something called a tileable detail map or sometimes called a micro map in different depends on what sort of um, engine you're inside of or CG. So for Marmoset, it's called detail normal map. And what this is, is a generic tileable normal map that tiles infinitely that when you get close, you can see the normal maps. So pay observations to the bottom side of the grayscale texture. You'll see how slightly this changes. So open up the micro detail. So when zooming in really far with the micro detail applied, we can change the detail weighting and how much it tiles and also the offset. If you really want to quickly get an export of a tileable normal map, you can actually do inside of Substance Painter. So all you do is come to file and then in the samples, they actually have a flat surface, which tiles. You can put a Perlin noise and then export that as a height map. So it's exactly the same as we did with the cornea. So you can go back to the videos where we see that only this time you're doing it on a flat surface. Okay. So also with the cornea, you want to double check that shadows are off. Otherwise the outer surface is going to cast a shadow on the inside and basically change the color. So we're getting pretty close here. What you can do is hold shift and right click. This will move the skylight around and then we can see how the subsurface is looking, how the shadows are looking and also the shine. So for lighting this, what you can do in the top left, we can add this little new light. What that does is it brings in what starts out as a spotlight, which is what we'll be using. And we can change the brightness and different attributes here. We're going to focus on brightness to start with. So zooming out, the first thing we really want to do is position this light in a way. My One of my favorite things to use up here is the light controller mode. So when you click that with the light selected, when we press on the left side of the screen on this gray orb, you can see how the light direction is changing based on what side of the surface I'm clicking. So usually what I do is I turn the brightness up really, really harsh so I can see the light on the final render. And then we just want to get an angle where it looks kind of cool. There's no sort of rules to this. Lighting a sphere is completely different 
than lighting, say, a character portrait. So you're just going to go with something that looks good. And when you like the angle of it, we can then tone down the brightness and just let it rest there. So you'd repeat that entire process on all sides. Control D will duplicate the light. And this time on the left side viewport, I'm going to look at the back and then we can insert another light, which will eventually turn into a rim light. But the problem is as I move this camera, you'll see on the right side that this camera moves. So what we're going to do is insert a brand new camera. So in the top left, you can click camera and we'll treat this as the one where the screenshot will come from. It's called camera one. So in the top right viewport, we can change this setting and select our camera one. So with camera one selected, now when we move, you'll see that we're moving the camera one first. So just get an angle that you want for your screenshot, maybe something like this. And now coming back to the left side of the viewport, we just want to switch this to main camera. And this means this, this is our working camera and then camera one is our render camera. Okay, so coming back to the lit rim light that we just created, come to the light controller and then click on the mesh. And then what I do is I look at the right side and see what effect it is having. So as this is a rim light, you want to have it quite bright. So I'm going to rotate the camera around as I go and then just adjust this, just so there's a little highlight on the horizon and that brings it away from the background. Now you don't always have to use the light controller. Inside of 3D scene, we can actually select one of these eyes and then use normal movement functionality. So using this gizmo, we can go up and down. Very useful one is actually to move in and out and then this changes the brightness of the light almost like the fall off. In fact, what I like to do is I create down here that you can see there are three separate viewports. And to create a new viewport, you select this little split button and split vertical or split horizontal. And then it's going to insert another window. So I set three up. I have one front gray, one top gray and left gray. And this basically means when I'm starting to move lights, instead of trying to navigate in 3D scene, I can just look at this and then move them in two axes at a time by selecting each one of the individual viewports. So a really cool technique. I haven't seen many people use it like this. So there's a nice little tip for you guys there. If you want the eye to pop a little bit more, you, you know, I was saying with the rim light to separate it from the background. Under the sky settings, we can come into our backdrop brightness. And as we scroll this down, it's darkening the background and making our eye pop out a little bit more. So to be honest, with something like an eye, which is dependent on reflectance, it's the same with metals inside of games engines. We want the skylight to do a majority of the work. Sometimes if you overlay it like the asset, it sometimes takes and subtracts away from the realism. So more lights isn't necessarily better. However, anywhere we can get this reflectant square can be a real benefit. So there's a neat little trick that I know of inside of Marmoset. So for example, with the lights that we've already implemented, first what I'm going to do is hide our skylight so we can see what our normal lights are contributing to. I'll hide the rim light, so this is our basic main light. Now in the left settings under spot settings, we have area and shape. So what I'll do is I'll turn this to a rectangle and change some of the parameters. You'll be able to see what happens. So when I change this to a rectangle, it's actually changing the highlight here to a nice square. And with the rectangle in the bottom left settings, we can change the X and Y. And you'll see it's actually adjusting the overall highlight. So we can play around with this. It's very similar and akin to what you would see in like a car showroom almost. So just adjust these to, to what you like. It also affects the contribution of the light itself. And then we can do the exact same with the rim light. So if we switch that to rectangle and then increase the width up really high, you'll be able to see what effect it has. So the bigger the spawning area of the light, the obviously the brighter it is. So you can either try and contract that with lowering the brightness down. However, now we're starting to break our PBR values because the light's going through the subsurface scattering and it's just messing everything up. So try not to go with too extreme values, anything that's sort of too unrealistic. You know, imagine this was a real life scene. You wouldn't have a massive skylight like this. It wouldn't even fit in a showroom or a factory. So just make it nice and small, as close as possible to what we would get in real life. And then that's gonna be a good metric. So you see here, we've got a very representable reflectance and we can go from there, change the brightness up and down as we please. Okay, so now we're over to capture a screenshot, maybe even a video once you've finished with that. So first we want to change the camera that we had. So we'll change this to camera one, which was our render camera. You can change the angle here and just go for something as interesting as possible. 
Now in the camera one settings, there are a couple of changes we can do. So the ones that you guys will be interested in is field of view. So field of view is just adjusting the perspective warp of it. Imagine taking a photo up close on your iPhone, your face is like massive and warped. Whereas if we use a really long lens, like you would see in wildlife photography, that's basically what the field of view is. So adjust this to something, again, not too extreme, but just makes your eye look good and realistic. When it comes to rendering, we don't want to render all this empty space. It'll be a waste of texture space and it won't fit on your portfolio that well. So to change the aspect ratio, we'll come into the render settings in the outliner. I've had to move myself to the, move the screen to the side a little bit. What we'll do here is change the resolution to something square. So instead of 1920 by 1080, which is a screen resolution, we can choose a square unit, which is 1920 by 1920. It's nice and square. Now, if we come back to our camera, we actually want to preview this on the screen. So come down to your settings. We'll activate under lenses, something called safe frame. Now, if we look back here, it's put a nice little square around. Now we can adjust our main camera to fit this eye in the area. Okay, so this is going to be the big screenshot. For me, it's very large. I've got a very huge screen, so it's kind of overwhelming. A nice little strategy I like to do is add an additional window, which is a smaller thumbnail, like an art director, or as we would look for artists, we would go for ArtStation and see those thumbnails. So come up to the split viewport button with the two little arrows. We can split this vertically. Now up in these settings, we can come to pop the viewport to a floating window. So what I've done is just made a smaller screen size off to the right. And now as I move the screenshot camera, you can see it's both moving on the large one and the small one at the same time. Now as an added effect, if you're working in OBS, you get to actually see two smaller versions of those. Okay, once you're happy with how it's looking, I'm not gonna spend too much time on perfecting this. I could easily spend a day just moving lights around, trying to make it as perfect as possible. This is looking quite well. You're welcome to do that as well in your own sort of time. In the render settings, we can actually come down here. And if you want to, you can turn the samples up. It won't make too much of a difference. I mean, you can turn this to 512 or a squared sort of unit. Just take some screenshots to see how it comes out. Choose a location for your export and then we'll click render image. Once you're happy with how that's looking, what you would then do is come back in here and then just double the size of each one of these resolutions and you can then scale it down. It's a form of anti-aliasing. So one additional setting in the render cameras, we can render multiple cameras. So maybe you want some different shots. For this, we just want one. So come to add new and then add the first camera and then we can hide our scene selector because we don't want to render that image out. So now you've increased your skills in real time from this series. If you're looking for additional content, I made a full members commentary where I go into detail over the overflow. So just some of the smaller pieces. There's also the downloadable content for the eye itself. So you can delve in and just look and see how the asset was created or maybe just use it on your projects alone. If you're interested, there's hours and hours of content to catch up on on YouTube members. So every month I do a questions and answers where people can ask their questions to me and I answer them in private videos and also full sets of feedback for works in progress on people's character projects. Along with a private discord and an integrated community, just that nice little bit of extra on top of YouTube. If not, there's loads of free content to catch up on the YouTube as well.